Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 96, A Fugitive Green, week six. Welcome back. So this is our final week with Helen Minnie in A Fugitive Green. We have gotten to know them from their own perspectives and vantage points, as well as Harry Corey and the O'Higginses. Mm-hmm. We've also met Minnie's mother and aunt and Minnie's father. I think these three chapters we are tackling today have so much humor in them and that is what Diana Gabaldon is good at, taking serious things and adding layers of laughter to it. Sometimes it's dark, sometimes it's uplifting, but she's so good at it. Have you fallen in love with Hal and Minnie just a little bit during this novella? I liked them so much before, and now I want to be best friends with Minnie. I see that she has so many attributes like Claire, she simply displays them differently. Another strong female character. And Hal is incredibly flawed. He's a disaster. But he's also, as many says, like a rooster. He's proud and he will defend what needs to be defended and fight for things. And he has a fearless nature to himself. They're a good match. So where we left off on the last podcast, Minnie had ducked out of the coach that Hal had put her in, and she had given him a fake address. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. So let's see what happens next. Chapter 16, Sick Transit. And that actually means something. It's part of a longer phrase, but here it means so passes. She disappears. The O'Higgins brothers had helped her disappear. And I love the use of the word foreign for foreign. To a Londoner, the world beyond the end of a street is as foreign as the Pope. All you need to do is keep away from the places folks are used to seeing you. So they come up with a plan to get her out of sight. Now, she still had work to do to finish up before she goes back to France. So this is going to complicate it a little bit. So she had the O'Higgins brothers help her the best that they could complete things. But some people only wanted to see her. So they were out of luck and couldn't do business. She had written a note to Lady Buford and paid her off and announced her return to France. Then she stayed with her Aunt Simpson and family for about a month. She had gone once with her aunt to the farm to where her mother is, but she couldn't bring herself to go into her mother's chamber. She simply had laid her head and hands against the cool door and wept silently. Gosh, she wants so much to have a mother's love, to have that warmth and security and safety. I feel that way. I'm 50 years old and I still miss my mother who's been gone for 40 years. And ah, what I wouldn't give to be able to curl up in the arms of her on so many different days, even still. But now she was on the deck of the Thunderbolt on the English Channel going toward France and her father. So she decides she's not going to tell her father who it is. What does that mean? Huh. He definitely knew who Pardlow was, the family background, and how fragile the respectability of the family was, and this made Pardlow vulnerable to blackmail. 
She's not sure exactly what her father would do. And he'd avoided blackmail for the most part in his work simply because it was dangerous, because you had no idea what the blackmailer and the person being blackmailed, what they would each do. And the person being blackmailed, what do they have to lose? They can be extremely difficult to predict. Oh, he tells the story of a woman who was being blackmailed and she'd invited the blackmailer to her home for dinner and poisoned him. But she didn't use the white, the correct drug. And it didn't kill him right away, but he realized what she had done and he strangled her over the dessert. So she ended up dying in the process of trying to save herself. So her father probably would not intentionally blackmail Hal himself. But then she also thought of the information gathered that could be used for blackmail by someone else. Edward Twelve Trees and his brother. Hmm. Her brain is working overtime in this situation. And if her father did find out it was Pardlow who who debauched her, <laughs> what would he do? Yikes. So she doesn't think he would kill him. But he may ask for some compensation for the loss of his daughter's virginity because it was a saleable commodity. I know that ruffles all of our feathers. It gets me in an uproar that a woman's virginity is a saleable commodity. And in some circles, it still is today. I can't even wrap my brain around how that is and how my virginity is more important than my intended spouse's virginity. I mean, it's, ah, that's a topic for a whole nother podcast. <laughs> and then she thinks the worst possibility of all would be that her father would try to force Hal to marry her. I mean, because he did want her to find a rich English husband And she exclaims, over my dead body. And this made a passing deckhand look at her funny. So she went over and over and over what she would say to her father, what she wouldn't tell him, what she might say. She made a speech, definite, calm, and firm. She was prepared for him to shout at her, rebuke her, disown her, show her the door. I love that she is thinking like a 17-year-old. But what she wasn't ready for was for him to look at her standing in the doorway and burst into tears. She didn't know what to say, but then he was crushing her in his arms. He wants to know if she's okay, and did the swine hurt her? What swine? What are you talking about? <laughs> no. After he lets her go, he gives her a handkerchief. That's when she realized that her own eyes were welling with tears. And then she just apologizes. All the things that she had practiced forgotten. She didn't mean to, but in her head, you did mean it. I didn't mean to hurt you, Papa. That's the first time in years she had called him that. And he had made a sound as if someone had punched him in the stomach. Oh, that's a father's heart breaking right in front of her. He apologizes. He should never have let her go alone. And she says, it was my fault. I, but what would she say? I what? He grabbed her and shook her gently. Don't ever say it was your fault. But it was her. I mean, she did say <laughs> she would prove it. Then he asked her to come and sit down and he'll make tea. She went into the room that had been so familiar, but now it felt like it had been years since she had been there, not months. It smelled wrong. She felt uneasy. Mm -hmm. When she sat down, her head began to spin and she took a deep breath, but the seasickness came back. The smell of dust and ancient silk and stewed tea, nervous sweat, Ugh. 
She says, how did you find out? Of course, how did he find out? He has people everywhere, right? They would know something happened. His spiders, all his spiders watching. And then she says, pardonnez-moi. And she gets up, opens the alley door, and throws up. <laughs> so what do you think is going on at this point? I think it's pretty obvious that <laughs> she's experiencing early pregnancy illness. <laughs> For about 15 minutes, she had to sit outside in the cool air. And she heard the bell of Saint-Chapelle striking the hour. And then the distant bong of Notre Dame de Paris. It was three o'clock. And all she could do was think of her mother and her aunt. It's almost time for known. When she hears the bell, she won't do anything until the prayer is done. And often she is silent afterward. The hours. Mm -hmm. So she decides to go back in. She's ready. She sits down and picks the cup up swishes it in her mouth, and then spits it in the aspidistra. <laughs> so I have to look up, of course, what aspidistra is. And it's a type of flowering plant that is native to eastern and southeastern Asia, particularly China and Vietnam. They grow in shade under trees and shrubs. Huh. I wonder how they got a hold of an aspidistra. And then she just kind of says unceremoniously that she saw her mother. This is where she reminds me of Claire, where with planning, she can say the right things and she has a speech and she knows what she's doing, but then everything goes out the window and her excellent communication skills and social skills also go out the window. <laughs> And he asks her where. And she says in London and wants to know if he knows where she is. What did she know, he was thinking. He says he kept kept in touch with her sister, Miriam. Mm-hmm. Yes, she's met Miriam. No, he hasn't seen her. He tried. He never saw her again after she told him she was with child. But he did try. He said they wouldn't allow it. Did you know that debauching a nun is a crime punishable by exposure in the pillory? And Minnie quite nastily says back, I imagine you bought your way out of it. He says, so would anyone capable of doing so, ma chère. But he had to leave Paris. And he had sent word to Miriam, who he didn't know at the time, to go find her and help her. So they get into a little bit of a kerfuffle here when he was saying that Emmanuel had gone mad when the child, and Minnie yells, when I was born. And she wants to know if he blames her for what happened to her mother. He doesn't. And then, again, unceremoniously, she just says, good, I'm pregnant. <laughs> really? Ugh. All the tact is gone. He turns white, and she thought he might faint, and she might too. And he says, no, I won't. I won't let such a thing happen to you. So she misreads this. And she says, you, and she wants to strike the table. And she tells him, don't you dare tell me how I can get rid of it. And she sweeps the cup and saucer off the table, smashes them against the wall in a spray of bohia or bohe. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But that happens to be a type of tea, of Chinese tea. And she said, I'd never do that. Never, never, never. So when you say something three times, it has a bit of more weight, doesn't it? He says, 
That's the last thing he would ever have her do. Ma chère, ma fille. His eyes were full of tears and her heart ached. And she knew he had come for her when she was born, come for his child, cherished and kept her. He took a step toward her. And they just stood together in each other's arms, weeping. She'd miss the smell of him, tobacco and black tea, ink and sweet wine. Papa. And she cried because she'd never be able to say mama. And this tiny baby inside of her would never know a father. And she'd never felt so sad and at the same time comforted. Have you ever had those experiences where there's something going on and your heart is breaking over it? But you still know it's going to be okay somehow. Her father had cared. He had come for her. He loved her. And now he was talking into her air, he, into her hair. He'd never let her be persecuted and abused as her mother was. Never let harm come to her or her child. Her mother went mad because she was put away in an asylum and mistreated. And it broke her. So thankfully, her father was a man of humility in some ways, and he understood what she needed and did not want to repeat history that had happened and have her treated poorly. That's a good papa. Even if he was trying to find her a husband, that was just the way of the world then. Were you surprised by his reaction? Were you surprised by her diligence and preparation and then it all going out the window? Chapter 17, Red Wax and Everything. This opens with how leaving Sir William Yong's office. He's the Secretary of War. And guess what? He really was the Secretary of War. You know, as I go through and prepare for the podcast, I look at the vocabulary words that are interesting and I look at p notable people and see if they're real. Let's see. He was the secretary at war from 1735 to 1746. What do you think about that? Yay, real person. I'll include links as usual so you can read all about him yourself. So Harry was waiting outside, very anxious for Hal, and Hal was grinning when he saw him. Harry howled like a wolf because he knew that this was good news. This was the one thing that Hal was waiting for, getting the king to sign that he could reinstate the 46th Regiment. He could resurrect his father's regiment. So they did it. King's signature and everything. Shall I read it to you? <laughs> Harry said, yes, every word, but not out here. And they decided to go to the beefsteak so they could get a drink. So they're greeted by Mr. Bodley, the club steward. And Hal reads, commissioned this day by His Royal Majesty, by the grace of God, George II. Oh my God, I can't breathe such a thing. Hal is so excited. <laughs> I can't wait till we get to meet Hal on screen. I have a vision of him myself, but I love how he's so emotive. And in a way that John isn't. It's fascinating to me how they function. So he is very excited and he keeps looking at this. And he was sure that Sir William would give him a story of refusal and why they couldn't do it. But hey, it worked. And Harry wants to know what did happen. 
Was Young friendly? Matter of fact, what did he say? I love that they're going into the details because I often presume that men do not talk about these details. But this is his closest friend, and Hal is very open. He doesn't have a problem emotionally communicating or saying things like they are or what he needs. Not when he has an intimate, and that's who Harry is to him. So Hal's trying to explain that Sir William was friendly enough, but his manner was odd. He wasn't nervous. <sighs> he can't quite put a name on it. He says he was greeted affably, and Harry whistles and he says, "My God, you are honored." I hear he only gives biscuits to the king and the first minister, though I imagine he'd give one to the queen too, should she choose to visit his lair. So the steaks are coming, and while they're waiting, he's bringing some eel pies. Oh, these dag nabbit eel pies, blech! So I looked up eel pies, and. They really gained favor with Henry the Eighth asking for eel pies in a specific pie shop, but they had been eaten in the early 16th and 17th centuries by Londoners because the Thames was full of eels and they were cheap. Yes, and so I looked up what an eel pie looks like, but also there's jellied eels, which I will put a picture in the post of. So. Unspeakably yucky. <laughs> I promised my husband I would never make eel pie. Yes, I've tried eel, and it's really chewy and funky.、Uh, I would eat it again if I was really hungry, but it is definitely not something I would put on an everyday menu. But so this has been eaten for a long time, and in this period, they would be widely available. I will also post some links to eel pie recipes. In the event any of you are so brave, when I'm posting recipes, because there's a notation in here of anticipatory bliss at the smell. There's onion, butter, parsley, but with some nutmeg and dry sherry. I think you'd have to do something to get rid of the funk. Trust me. So they eat happily. Well, the eel pies had reminded Hal of Ketrix, the other eel pie house, and that young woman,、mm -hmm. meaning Wilhelmina Rennie, which is what he knows her by, or Lady Bedelia Houghton. <laughs> oh, it's such a great name! And to think of her, it caused its usual frisson of mixed emotions. And frisson is a moment of emotional excitement, shudder, thrill. It's disquieting, and the origin is French for shiver, from Old French frisson, from late Latin friction, frictio. There you go.、Hmm. He wasn't quite sure what the emotions were: lust, curiosity, annoyance, longing. He's in love with her. I just can't put a name on it at the moment. So Harry plays kind of dumb. Ketrix, Ketrix Eel Pie House, you mean? And what young woman? Yeah, Harry, come on, you're laying it on a little thick, man. And Hal just says, "The girl I caught magicking the drawer of my desk the night of the ball." And so Hal explains, and Harry says, "Oh, that girl." Mm-hmm. Okay. Harry and Hal have known each other basically their entire life. So, what do you think is going through Hal's head right now? He knew that Hal. He knew that he had not told Harry everything, but he had told him that he was satisfied with what she told him. Actually, a long way satisfied. Actually, a long way from satisfied, but. And that she sent him, gosh, Almighty! And that he'd sent her in a coach and requested her address, which she'd given, and it was wrong. It didn't exist, and how she had escaped. 
Mm-hmm. And that she had asked the coachman to drop her at Ketrix because she was hungry and she ran off, never to be seen again. That was a pretty interesting story. You think that Harry would remember the girl. And he'd also mentioned her several times. So Hal is simply thinking this over as he's eyeballing Harry. He says, Humph. Well, regardless, there was a bit of cordial conversation, quite cordial, though all through it there was something odd in Sir William's manner. Rather grave. That's why I thought he was working up to a refusal, but then sympathetic. And Harry's like, really? Why do you suppose? I, I hear Harry Quarry as having a deeper, gruffer, boisterous voice. And Hal says, I don't know. Only at the end, when he'd given me the certificate and congratulated me, shook my hand and held onto it for a moment. And he gave me a brief word of condolence on my, my loss. Hmm. And at this, there was a sharp pang of emotion and he had to clear his throat. And Harry says, oh, he's probably only being decent. But Harry was now flushing up his neck and into his cheeks. Hmm. And Hal thinks at the time he was so happy he wouldn't even have cared if he'd told me that a crocodile had a hold of my foot. But now that he thinks about it, Harry laughed, but the flush had spread to his nose. Now it was glowing. It's not only Jamie Fraser who gets pink, apparently. So now Hal is wondering, as he's piecing things together, if it was some reference to that petition, the one that Twelve Trees put together, saying that he was not right in the head. No, he didn't actually mention the petition, Sir William. The eel pies arrived, and they ate and didn't talk for a minute. And afterward, Hal gives Harry a straight look. And he wants to know what Harry knows about that petition. And this is where the years of friendship, 20 years, pays off. He'd known Harry Quarry since Harry was two and himself five. Harry could lie if given a warning and enough time to prepare, but he couldn't lie to Hal and knew it. <laughs> so Claire can't really lie either. She has that glass face unless she absolutely prepares for it. Mm-hmm. So Harry thinks about it, closes his eyes, and Hal's sitting there looking at him with his hands flat on the table. He's not going to hit Harry or strangle him. <laughs> He says, Harry, whatever you did, I forgive you. Just bloody tell me, all right? This also reminds me, this is such a bromance of how Jamie talks to Claire. Like, I've already forgiven you. I just need to know what happened. So Harry looks up and tells him everything. <laughs> and Hal murmurs, Irumabo. But you told her not to take the letters, you say. Harry swears it because of what Hal felt about them and Hal believes him. And now fresh plates come with a sizzling platter and they sat quietly and ate their steak with wild mushrooms, boiled onions and butter. That sounds delicious. And they order a bottle of Bordeaux. Mm-hmm. And Hal was thinking of Minnie. I didn't want you to be hurt. The look on her face when she said it, and he believed her then and believes her now. Shall I prove it? And she did prove it. <laughs> and I love this line. A violent shiver ran through him at the memory. <sighs> yeah, well, I think she proved it. And Harry sees this and asks if he's okay. Are you okay, old man? He's like 25 years old. And then he tells Harry that she wasn't stealing the letter. She was putting them back. He saw her do it. And 
she didn't send them to Sir William. Sure of it. Harry says he trusted her, but she could have made copies. And by the way of Yong's manner, the Hal shook his head. He would swear not. The way she... Mm, no, I'm sure not. <laughs> because Hal goes on to say if Sir William had seen the letters, he never could have looked him in the face, let alone behave as he did. Something convinced him that he had cause to challenge Twelve Trees. He's certain of it. And perhaps the girl did find someone who knew about the affair. Hmm. If someone of good character swore to it. And Harry agrees and says that's what he asked her to do, to be discreet. Hal forgave Harry. But the thought that somebody else knew, unknown to him, it made him want to set fire to his own head to obliterate the thought. He has such passion. <laughs> he just burns Hal Burns. He took some deep breaths instead, and the tightness in his chest began to loosen. Do you have those days where you just want to, like, burn the world down, break everything, toss tables? Yeah. Poor Hal's been living in that for months. They couldn't do anything about it now. The regiment was in order, and that euphoria was coming back. It was his. There was the certificate, red wax seal, and all right there on the linen cloth. Hence our chapter title. And as he goes to cut into the steak, the hot red juice ran out, and he saw it in memory, the small blood stain on the white hearth rug, and heat washed over him, as though he had set his hair on fire. <laughs> and then he looks at Harry and says, there's one thing he can do, help him find her. And this really made Harry pause for a moment, his mouth agape. And he says, of course, but Miss Rennie had vanished. They're going to figure it out, though, aren't they? And then he lifts his glass and says, confusion to all 12 trees. Hal returns the salute and drinks. Uh, they drank like several bottles. I'm sure they were feeling no pain. <laughs> One thing my father always said to me, Harry, they can't beat you if you don't give up. And as he toasts, I don't. And this makes Harry grin. No, God help us all. You don't. <laughs> there's something, there's that energy of Hal's that is engaging and endearing and I'd want to be his friend, even though he does feel a bit dangerous, too. I would have a good friend like that. He has his tribe of Harry. And as John gets older, he'll be part of his tribe as well. Hal is pretty closed off to most, but the people he's intimate with, he's all in, right there. That sort of reminds me of my husband. When you're in, you are in hard, and you are close, and you are intimate. But everyone doesn't see that fire, that passion, the danger. Chapter 18, Taking Flight. Amsterdam, Calverstraat, 18, January 3rd, 1745. So this is about six months. And we see Minnie eating. The queasiness had gone, and she's has this incredible appetite. It's likened to the ravening of an owl. And that means to feed greedily, to prowl for food, plunder, to devour greedily. So she's at that point of pregnancy where 
she must eat all the things and she's starving and she's craving all kinds of different types of foods, especially sweets. <laughs> Her father says, you look at food, ma chère, and turn your head to and then fro as though you expect it to bolt and then you swoop on it and gulp, it's gone. <laughs> oh. And she like piffs this idea, but then she was looking for more of the olibolin in the pottery jar, which there are these sweet, buns that have powdered sugar on top, but, but they were gone. And she lovingly calls the baby Mortimer. She was still hungry, and she asked her dad if dinner is nearly ready, which dinner would be the lunch meal, the big meal. And we see that the house is an Amsterdam-style house, long and narrow, and it has different levels. And she could smell roasting chicken. And she was famished in spite of the olibolin. She heard her father, and he said, It's not even noon. Dinner won't be ready for another hour at least. But I brought you some coffee and rolls with honey. She is carb loading. <laughs> She's like, Honey. Oh. And he notes that the child is nearly as big as she is. When did you say it will be born? Minnie is not tall. Okay, Hal is what? Maybe five, eight? somewhere in there and he's much taller than her so she's probably sitting at five foot five one and when women that petite are pregnant the baby only has out to go there's not a lot between waist and hip so you get huge looking because there's no other place for the baby to go to <laughs> and she says in about three months and the midwife says it will be just about double in size by then. Yeah, about this point, because if she's... Mm, if she's six months along, she's, we're looking at third trimester, yeah. <sighs> Weight-wise, baby will be more. Length-wise, yeah, double's not quite right, but... Usually right around third trimester, babies are a couple of pounds or ish and 14, 15 inches long. Average babies are about 19 to 20 inches long, 21 inches maybe, and anywhere from six and a half to eight and a half pounds. So, hmm. Mortimer, that's so cute. And he doesn't even think that will be possible, <laughs> that she could get that much bigger. And he reaches over and puts his hand on the curve of his grandchild. Comment ça va, mon petit? And she wants to know what makes him think it's a boy. And it's because she keeps calling him Mortimer. And I looked this up, and this product doesn't exist, but she tells him it was taken from an advertisement on a bottle of English patent medicine, Mortimer's Dissolving, Resolving, and Absolving Tonic removes stains of any kind, physical, emotional, or moral. <laughs> I want to make a pretend bottle of this. I think that's just like straight up whiskey or vodka or gin or something. Drink until everything gets better. She was joking. And... She was laughing and waved him away to the kitchen. Sundays were a favored day because their maid has, was home with her own family. And they were going by Snyder. Willem Snyder was her father's gnome de guerre in the Low Countries. And they were fending for themselves on Sunday. And they were trying to find a nice gentleman who would be willing to take a widow with a child if there was a sufficient generous inducement, the whole I have to pay you to marry you thing, that's something I just don't get. <laughs> I will never understand a dowry. Unless there was a political marriage to forge bonds between families. I don't know. It seems very odd. 
She doesn't think her father would be above doing that, yeah, but she'd think about it later. She was enjoying the coffee and the roll and the honey. And then Mortimer decides to stretch. This makes her gasp. Oh yes, any of us who've been in advanced pregnancy, oh my goodness, what those babies can do to us. They don't care about our ribs and liver and bladder and intestines. Mm -mm. And she says, you little bastard, and then apologizes. He wouldn't be on paper. They'd make up a story about the dead husband that was not easily verifiable. Maybe a German, maybe a Spaniard, but not definitely not an Englishman. Mortimer could be a girl in her mind, but she only could think of him as a male because she couldn't think of him without thinking of his father. And maybe she would eventually marry. Hmm. She says there's time. Right now she's working on the accounts and trying to straighten out the books. Within a half an hour, she figured out where the problem was. And to the gurgling noises of her belly, she decides to go out. But the bell rings over the door. And to her surprise, the man standing in the doorway was not Dutch or virtuous. He was wearing a British uniform. Your grace, she says. Hal, my name's Hal. And then he sees the full body of her and he turns white. Jesus Christ. It's not what you think. <laughs> She's clearly very pregnant, right? And he looks at her and he takes a deep breath and he strides toward her. And she could hear her father coming up the stairs, but only saw Hal's bone white face. Shock and determination it was filled with. When he gets to her, he bends his knees and he picks her up. And again, Jesus Christ, because her weight was considerable. <laughs> Hal's not a big guy. He's strong, but he's not big. He clenched his teeth. He clutches her tightly, and he weaves his way across the shop, staggering only slightly. She thinks he smells wonderful of bay leaves and leather. Oh, these two. Remember back in The Scottish Prisoner when... Minnie was telling Lord John the story of how they got married and it was only, you know, Harry was there <laughs> and that it was just private. So it was fine that he missed it. Like no, everybody else missed it too. <laughs> and John was scandalized because of the story and the hearth rug. Yes. So we're getting the whole other side of it. And there outside the open door was Harry Corey holding a coach door open. His solid square face broke into an enormous grin as he met her eyes. <laughs> Pleased to see you again, Miss Rennie. Hurry up, old man. Somebody's coming. <laughs> and her father's yelling behind, Minnie, stop, you. And he's yelling. And Hal basically throws her into the coach and jumps in after her while Harry was hanging precariously off the coach's step, shouting at the driver, then she, all she hears is, Minnie! <laughs> Her father's shout was faint, but audible. So she couldn't turn and look out the rear window because she'd have to stand up and rotate her whole body. At this point, Hal had taken off his military cloak and tucked it round her, and the warmth of his body surrounded her, and his face was no more than a few inches from hers, still white, He had his hands on her shoulders, steadying her against the jolting, and she thought he might kiss her. But then a lurch sent him staggering, and he fell backward into the seat opposite Harry Corey, who was still grinning ear to ear. Oh, my gosh. I can see this playing out inside my head. And she wants to know where he's taking her. What? He says. Where are you taking me? 
I don't know. Where are we going? He asked Harry. <laughs> so they're going to a place on the Kaisersgracht, which is the widest and biggest canal in Amsterdam. It's called the Emperor's Canal. And the place they're going to on the canal is called Dugavalda Gans. It's called the Stuffed Goose. <laughs> A pub. The Stuffed Goose. I think Minnie's Goose is stuffed as his house at this point. And Hal tells her he's taking her to be married. And she notes that he's very pale and a muscle near his mouth twitched. The only thing he couldn't control, she thought, well, that and her. Mm-hmm. And he says, I married a lady and she became a whore. I cannot complain if it should be the other way about this time. You think I'm a whore, do you? She wasn't sure whether to be amused or insulted. Perhaps both. <laughs> yeah, him being so candid, uh, he loses his social skills as well. Do you normally sleep with your victims, madam? And she stares at him in a level manner and folds her arms atop the rounded curve of her belly. I wasn't asleep, your grace. And if you had been, I think I would have noticed. <laughs> oh, yay. They're so funny. Perfect match for each other. I mean, no doubt about it. And so we get to see the description of the stuffed goose. It's a pretty yucky, nasty pub. There's a drunk huddled against the steps. And she wants to know why Harry picks this place. Because the landlady's husband is a minister, he says. And reputed not to be too fussed about things. Things like a wedding license, she thought. Huh, maybe you don't need one when getting married in a different country. Like, she has no idea. So Hal tells her to go in because it smells bad out there. And she's not sure it will smell better inside. Oh, but it got her. The stench got her and she vomits. He says he will get her a gin and gives her a white handkerchief and hustles her through the door. So Harry's dealing with the payment and negotiating everything being done. And he orders a gin. And I looked up and gin is kind of a wonder, a wonder help, wonderful helper. It helps settle the stomach. It's supposed to help, help in weight loss and all sorts of other things it's supposed to do. Uh, so I will again post a link to this. Really fascinating. I had no idea that Jim was a digestive. But as soon as she took a sip, she felt better. The nausea went away. The floor grounded beneath her. And she felt pretty normal. Well, as normal as she could be in six months pregnant on the verge of marrying Hal. <laughs> so the minister who had been sick with La Grippe, which remember there's an Outlander Science Club episode which I'll post the link to in here as well, talking about La Grippe. And he asks Hal if he wants to marry her. Now, if you please. So the minister looks at him and his wife is there. And he's holding on to, ha to Minnie's hand very tightly. So tightly, he had to apologize. So the minister, a bit reproachfully, says, She's this child? Hal knows that. Get on with it, please. At once, and Minnie says, Why? Do you have somewhere special you have to be? <laughs> oh, her sarcasm. I want to be her buddy. He wants the child to be legitimate. And he says she might give birth at any moment. I will not. You know I'm no more than six months gone. Now she's offended. you got the pregnant mama bear going. And he's about to say what she looks like, and then he shuts his mouth and coughs. So the minister blows his nose, gets his wife, comes out with a battered prayer book, 
its cover spotted with cronk rings. Well, I don't know what that is. I tried to look it up, and the only cronk I can find is from Emperor's New Groove, which is one of my very favorite Disney movies. Hmm. Yes, I'm probably going to have to put a clip from Emperor's New Groove in the post as well, because he's funny. So they want to know where the witnesses are. Hal has to go find Harry because he went out to pay for the carriage. And the minister asks her if she's willing to marry this man. And he says, I see he is rich, but maybe better to take a poor man who will treat you well. And the minister's wife says, Zia ses manden zvanga idiot. She's six months gone with child and wants to know if it, this is the jerk, the no good man who got her pregnant. <laughs> the minister's wife does not mince words. Yeah, is the shirk? She assured the woman that yes, this was the jerk. So Hal comes back in with Harry. And he smiles reassuringly at Minnie and patted her hand before lining up solidly beside Hal. This did give her reassurance. If a man like Harry was Hal's good friend, then perhaps, just perhaps, she wasn't wrong about him. It wouldn't make any difference because she was getting married. And this sent a pleasant shiver up her back, as though she was about to jump off a cliff, but feeling a great pair of wings and furling at her back, even as she looked out into the wind quite a risk taker. They both are. So the landlady asks for their names to put in the register book. And so Hal just says Harold Gray. Only two names, no titles. No, she is not marrying the Duke of Pardlow or even the Earl of Melton, just him. Sorry to disappoint if that's what you thought. But it was more apologetic than accusing. And then he says, my middle name is Patricius, Harold, Patricius, Gerard, Bleeker, Gray. Really? The woman said she's not going to write all that down. But Bleeker is Dutch. And the minister said, your family is Dutch. My father's mother's mother, Hal said, equally surprised. So the woman writes down, Harold Bleeker Gray. On you? So Hal goes to speak to her, and he says, she's called Wilhelmina Rennie. Actually, it's Minerva Wattiswade. Wattiswade? What's Wattiswade? Not what. Who? Me, in fact. This was too much for Hal. He looked at Harry. She means her name isn't Rennie, old man. It's Wattiswade. Nobody's named Wattiswade. I'm not marrying you under an assumed name. <laughs> oh, this is just comical. No, I'm not bloody marrying you under an assumed name. Gosh, he says. I can see this playing out so beautifully. And then she says, your baby kicked me in the liver. <laughs> oh, you mean your name really is Wattis Wade? Yes. And then she's. he says that she'll... Tell him later why she's been calling herself Rennie. And she says, no, I won't. Didn't matter. He decided it just didn't matter. All right. And then her middle name, Cunagunda. Minerva Cunagunda Wattiswade. Wow. These parents really knew how to name children. So Cunagunda was the daughter of Siegfried, Count of Luxembourg, and she has been sainted under Saint Cunegundus. And she was crowned queen at Paderborn, Germany in 1002, Holy Roman Empress in 1014, and she received the crown from Pope Benedict VIII. So, she committed some miracle proving her innocence over allegations by walking over pieces of flaming iron without injury. So, she was named 
I'm assuming Minnie was named after this saint and she who died of natural causes in 1040. There you go. And she was canonized in 1200 by Pope Innocent III. Wow, that's quite a name. And Hal was laughing. Harry was arguing with the woman about something because they needed another witness, and they finally came to the fact that the wife could be a witness. And her name was Mrs. Ten Boom. At this point, the baby had been moving quite a lot, and Minnie was sweating, and her ears felt hot. She's going to throw up or pass out if they don't hurry. She's worried her father is going to bust in at any moment. She wanted it to be hers alone. So they got on with it, and the Reverend Ten Boom blinked. Now, there is a Reverend Ten Boom, but it's a different one. But he did really exist. Minnie could not keep up with everything in Dutch. Instead, she was hearing phrases from the letters, not the ones that Esme wrote, Hal's letters to her. Letters written to a dead wife in passionate grief and fury and despair. He might as well have punctured his own wrists with the sharpened quill and written those words in blood. She looked up at him now, white as the winter sky, as though all the blood had run out of his body, leaving him drained. But his eyes were a pale and piercing blue when he turned his dark brown face toward her and the fire in him was not quenched by any means. And she thinks to herself, you didn't deserve him toward the absent Esme. She put her hand on her gently heaving stomach, but you loved him. Don't fret. I'll take care of them both. The end. Ooh. So this is how, how and many get married and how they end up welcoming their first child. And she did end up getting the wealthy English husband that her father wanted after all. And they both were in love with each other. They were passionate about each other. So in the author's notes, Diana goes on to talk about some time discrepancy. And she says that her more OCD prone readers are very distracted by this and they aren't happy because they mishmash the timeline sometimes. And that's okay. So those of us who really look at the facts like this, it's just not important to the overall storytelling is what she assures us. So it's okay. Don't worry about it. She also goes on to talk about the whale painters and that they really did exist. I hope you have enjoyed this six week series. I have, and I'm so glad we got to delve into it. There is not time prior to season three of Outlander airing for us to go into Besieged. So I will save that for after season three. Um, maybe before we jump into the next book, which is a very big book. We'll be doing a read along before season four, which I presume will take at least a year. Uh, it'll be about 11 to 12 months worth of podcast read-along episodes to get through Drums of Autumn. It's a giant book. I'm already looking at breaking it down and I'm stunned. It's going to take quite a lot of preparation for me. But I do plan on starting that series on January 1st, 2018, after season three ends. So now we see the foundational structure for Hal and Minnie and really who both of them are. And we also can put together now the things that she told Jamie Fraser in The Scottish Prisoner and why she told him to keep John away from 12 trees, to keep out of that. Because there's that nemesis, Bowles, right, who's running everything in the background, but she gave... Jamie some really sound advice, but it was impossible for him to adhere to it and follow it simply because of the circumstances that happened when they were in Ireland. 
but it also tells us that she's probably still running information quietly and she's still doing some work for her father and Hal trusts her. He knows what she's capable of and he knows she understands this part of business. And so he relies on her. They are definitely partners and he knows probably most of what she's doing. So do you have a different perspective on Harry Corey now? I mean, you met him a little bit in Voyager and we met him more here and there in Lord John books. And we saw him a bit in the Scottish prisoner. He's a good wingman. He's a good friend. He's the kind of best friend that I think we all want, right? We also got to see more about the 12 trees family and what I find so fascinating about that is the Greys really respect the 12 trees because they consider them patriots and they consider them honest. But yet, they're always fighting. There's always tension. They're not going to get along. And that they were actually friendly before Nathaniel started having an affair with Hal's wife, Esme. Hmm. And I wonder... Did Minnie ever tell Hal that she wrote a poem attributing it to Nathaniel that was the linchpin for him to get his regiment resurrected? That she was able to keep all the other letters private, but that she wrote something different that had the same result? I don't know. She didn't say anything about that in The Scottish Prisoner. So I wonder if that little piece of information will come back. Like all the characters that Diana Gabaldon writes, they come across as multidimensional. They are not flat on the page. And we really get to see understanding of them. Like we get to see how they work and how they think and what sets them apart from the other person. And... We get that flavor for them as if they're really in the room with us. I appreciate that so much about her writing, and that's probably why I've been reading her books since they came out. And I go back to them over and over and have this podcast because, frankly, the material is brilliant. And I'm always surprised when people don't like it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, I don't understand you whatsoever. How can we be friends? Um... But Minnie is like 17, 18 years old-ish, right? And at the point in The Scottish Prisoner, she's, what, in her 30s. So it's all one big puzzle piece. Okay. So next up, since we're now just waiting for Season 3 of Outlander to come out, I will be doing some... So where can you find a Dram of Outlander? Facebook, there's Dram of Outlander page and the group you have to ask to be a part of. Instagram and Twitter is Dram of Outlander without the A in front. The website is adramofoutlander.com. You sense a theme here. I would love to hear your feedback. You can phone in to 719-425-9444 to the listener line. You can shoot me an email at contact at adramofoutlander.com or you can just leave a comment when I post the podcast link. How can you support the podcast? Well, the best way is to tell other people about it. Share the information, share the website, share the social media. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play where you listen through and please post feedback because that helps people find me. You can financially help support the podcast. I do this all by myself and produce it every single week. And it's patreon.com slash a dram of outlander. Or if you want to make a one-time offering, just contact me by email or the phone number. And I thank you for listening. Without you, there is no reason for me to do this. 
and I love how the podcast is evolving and I would also love your feedback on what other kinds of topics you would like to hear. If you want to come on the show and be a guest host, hey, again, drop me an email or a phone call. And I look forward to seeing you week after week here. And as soon as the television show comes back on the air, be on the lookout for Outlander Science Club. There's going to be a whole lot for Claire to do. And I hope to see you on Wednesday nights at our standing Twitter chat. It is under the hashtag ADOO, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And we talk about the prior week's podcast and any news that has come up. That's turned into a nice little exchange. You all are very smart, and I love to hear what you come up with as well. So I'll see you again next week. And until then... Slange of